Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special book launch. Tonight, it is Spiral Mind by Janina Arndt. I'm going to give a quick introduction to MX Publishing and Orange Book Books. My name is Steve Emmets, and I'm the uh, founder of MX Publishing. We're going to have a live reading from Spiral Mind, and then we're going to go into an author Q&A. So for all of the fans that are online, please start uh, putting your questions into the Q&A window or, or the chat window, and we'll come to those questions with Janina as we get to the end. So a very quick introduction. Um, MX was founded in 2006, so 15 years ago. It's the largest Sherlock Holmes publisher in the world. We've got about 150 authors and about 500 books out there. If you add up all of the different languages that we've published books in, um, we've probably had about 2 million books out there. Um, many of those were in Italy and Russia. They're two big translation countries for us. And we've got involved in print and ebooks, um, audio books, and even art and merchandise in the recent uh, couple of years. Uh, in terms of Orange Pip Books, it was founded in 2019. A big shout out and thank you to Nico Vaughan, who is our uh, commissioning editor for Orange Pip. There was a feeling that we really needed to bring a new imprint into the homes world so that we could cater to a, a wider audience. Typically, MX Publishing publishes books that are in the style of and in the voice of and in the era of the original Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and what Orange Pip was created for was to, to bring and that alternative so that we could publish stories that were alternatives to the traditionals, including some LGBTQ plus and also Bane characters into the world of Sherlock Holmes. Modern adaptations, other characters as, as the core characters within the books, etc. So here's a selection of some of the books we've published in the last uh, 12 months. So um, Bob Mady has created a fantastic novel um, featuring Inspector Lestrade as the key character. Um, Claire Dane's amazing book, um, uh, really uh, focusing on um, the world of Lewis Carroll with Hunting of the Nark and some fantastic characters in there. Coming out next month, um, a brilliant book by Dorothy Ellen Palmer. She's a Canadian writer, uh, Wiggins, uh, son of Sherlock. Um, quite controversially, David McGregor, um, a trilogy of books coming out this year. Um, and you can probably guess from the title, Sherlock in Love, um, really the Sherlock Holmes and Irene Adler trilogy there, and uh, an excellent um, series of uh, comic books coming from... Um, uh, with the hand of Nico Vaughan in there as well, Violet Holmes and the Agents of Hive. A um, little bit of background on the overall group, which is MX and Orange Pit. We're a social enterprise. Um, we support three key causes, um, Stepping Stone School in the UK, Happy Life Children's Home in Kenya, and uh, the United Nations World Food Programme. Stepping Stone School has a big link to Sherlock Holmes because it's where uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, many of them, including Hound of the Baskervilles. And in that picture, you can see a beautiful old building uh, built around at the turn of the century and a very modern building at the side of that. Um, we've been partnered with them since 2009 and I've been a patron since 2016. We've raised over $75,000 for the school to keep the uh, legacy of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle going there. We do a bunch of events and awareness. So we've actually broadcasted some Sherlock Holmes theatre from the school as well. Close to our hearts is uh, Happy Life Children's Home. Uh, we've been working with them since 2012. Uh, both myself and my wife are mentors there, and that's Sharon in the picture there with some of the kids. We spend every Christmas out there with the, with the children, uh, apart from this year. Uh, it's very sad that we're not able to be out there with the, with the 100 plus children um, due to COVID-19, but we've been working hard in the background with them um, on events and awareness and some projects. Um, very cool project we got involved with in 2020, which was um, called Books to Trees. So every book that was bought on our website, we would plant a tree at Happy Life. And we had to stop planting trees uh, in August because we'd actually um, funded a thousand trees, which was plenty for them. And a lot of those trees have been converted into fruit trees so that under COVID, the kids have additional um, sources of um, food and sustenance. 
The other program that we're involved with is the United Nations World Food Program. Uh, we've been working with them since 2017. I've been a tech mentor since then, and Sharon has actually just joined as a marketing mentor for them as well. So they're based out of, um, headquartered in Rome, but the innovation accelerator is based out of Munich. Um, and we've been traveling over to Munich to get involved there as well. And we're, we're super proud that the team uh, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2020 for the world for work that we're all doing um, in combating world hunger. So on to the subject of the evening tonight. So Janina Arndt uh, will be going live to her shortly. Um, Spiral Mind is a Sherlock Holmes novel. And here we have three key characters, uh, very familiar to us, Sherlock and John and Scarlet, but also uh, a real favorite with the fans, Moriarty. So I can't wait to start asking some questions from Janina in just a second. But what we're going to do is I'm going to stop my screen share for a second and we're going to go on to Janina and Janina is going to do a quick reading from the book. So yep. hopefully the technology works. Oh, so hi, Janina. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Fantastic. And I love the fact that you've got a, a, a red phone box <laughs> over your head. Yes, yes, absolutely. There. A bit of, bit of London up here. A bit of London, but you're not in London, are you? I'm not in London, no. I'm in Durham. You're in Durham. Okay. And for the for the non-Brits, that's slightly north of Watford uh, in terms <laughs> of the UK. That's quite up north. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Fantastic. Just by Newcastle, yeah. Excellent. And, and you're going to do a little reading for us from the book now. Yeah. Um, and you're going to do that from the screen. So everybody expecting you to put, a, put some paper up in front of you. <laughs> uh, are disappointed but you've got a copy can you hold a copy of the book up have you got one there yes, I've got I've got lots of them I sleep with them no um <laughs> uh yeah they are out there they are real and available which is which is probably the most exciting moment uh was when when my first copies arrived I was like this is this is actually a book now <laughs> yeah that's a big moment for an author when you first get the the, the copy of the, the real book in your hands it's it's quite exciting so over to you and you're going to do a quick reading now. Yeah, absolutely. So this um, this piece is um, from the first chapter of the first part. It's not quite uh, the very beginning. So it's a little bit further in. Um, so yeah, um, I will just read this passage as it is. And um, I hope you guys will all um, wonder about all the questions that I'm, that I'm basically presenting you with and all the questions that Sherlock might be wondering about in this. Um, passage. So yes, um, might add uh, for ease of listening that this is from the point of view of Scarlet, who is a new character that I'm bringing in, um, who's sort of uh, experiencing the whole world of Sherlock and London for the first time. So yeah, here we go. Holmes smirked infectiously. I could see why he and John got along so well. He didn't give me time to contemplate, otherwise I would have had time to inspect something that caught my eye. A strangely dusty cap with ear flaps lurking behind a corner. As it was, I didn't give it much further thought. With a swift step, we headed down the embankment and turned into Temple, exiting at Fleet Street, where Holmes had apparently ordered another cab to wait for us. Yet when we arrived and Holmes raised a hand, it simply drove off. What's going on here? Don't tell me someone's stealing the cab. Well, I'm afraid so, Holmes swiftly paced up and down the pavement. Couldn't you have known that earlier? John said you knew everything just by looking at it. Yes, I do, but I had expected them to hijack it once we were inside. What? I exclaimed. Well, what do you expect? We're being watched. His voice had gone really quiet now. What were you going to take me into? Couldn't you at least have warned me about a thing or two? Instantly, my eyes fell on a red dot behind some curtain in a tall apartment building across the street. The thought gun barrel shot through my brain. 
At first, I wasn't sure if that impression was fright or reality. But then I saw the small red spot of a laser pointer dancing across Holmes's chest. Don't worry, they're not going to shoot me, Holmes reassured me as calmly as ever. I've still got something they want. Are they pointing one at me too? I asked softly. Holmes nodded. No sudden movements or you're dead. These are incompetent snipers. They'll aim at your leg and hit you in the back of the head. Slowly walk into that shop. They'll be waiting for us there. Turning to the shop, I immediately saw a tall man in a tweed suit and the ear flap hat with a revolver in his pocket. He was closely examining something with his hands, a cap or something of that kind, not unusual in a clothes shop. The only thing that startled me when we entered was that I had seen that cap before, but where? Good afternoon, Mr. Holmes. Would you please follow me? The strange man mumbled. I wondered why he was stooping constantly. It didn't seem to be part of his natural appearance, but the disguise was rather spoiled by it. I could hear in the way he maintained his voice that it was capable of reaching wide distances. One strand, longer than the rest of his hair, hid behind his ear. The man had a bald patch in the middle of the head which he was clearly trying to conceal with longer strands, and one of them had fallen out, despite the tons of hair gel I could see on it. So, the man had had time in the morning, but afterwards, something had disturbed him that had made him take off his hat at least once, without giving him time to fix his hair. Holmes also observed the man closely, as we followed him into the back of the shop, and then upstairs. I wondered what else he saw. Finally, we reached a small dark room. The strange man offered us a seat in front of a desk behind which he himself sat down. Mr. Holmes, I presume you know why you're here, he said coldly. Holmes nodded, just as I said. You have failed to comply with our ultimatum. Are we still firm or do we hold our own brother dear after all? Asked the man. You know my answer, Holmes retorted. Very well then, we will arrange a meeting for you and your brother some time from now, if he doesn't change his mind about helping us out. If you refuse, we know other means, but that's not news to you, the man continued. Unfortunately, we'll have to keep the young lady's luggage apart from this box, which arrived at Baker Street this morning. Ericsson. Another tall man came in, holding a box with my two guinea pigs. He was wearing a black suit and sunglasses. It looked ridiculous next to the tweed. The box hit the desk with a bang and I quickly bent down to catch a glimpse of my pets. Fortunately, the little rodents looked unharmed, but it seemed naive to think they weren't involved in some plan. I would have to examine them at Baker Street. You may go now, Mr. Holmes, twanged the tweed man as Ericsson opened the door. Holmes shot a suggestive glance at me. Together we rose. When I saw his hands moving forward, I immediately turned around, taking the chair I'd been sitting on, smashing it on Ericsson's head. Holmes had overthrown the desk, burying the tweed man under it, and within seconds, we were in the hall of the upper floor, the door locked behind us. I clutched the box with the guinea pigs, which I grabbed when Holmes had taken Ericsson's keys. We'll need to climb through the window. They're expecting us to come out through the back and the front door is senseless anyway, Holmes advised me. We won't be able to take the, take the box with us, but they'll see to bringing it back to you. His frown opened up a landscape of theories about my pets. Then he turned to me once again. So if you don't mind, he opened the window and lifted me up at my waist, going first. I put the box on the chest next to the window, then pulled myself up by the frame. He held me until I sat firm, but it wasn't until he let go that I noticed I had to jump approximately eight feet. I had never made such a leap in my life that I knew of. Strangely, I wasn't afraid. I took a glance at Holmes and jumped. Again, the ground felt sudden rather than hard. A thought hit me, an impossible one. He could have just let me climb the chest, 
No, there must be another explanation. Don't flatter yourself. I shook my head. This was an impossibly bewildering first day in London. I wondered if this was normal for the city. What the hell would anyone want with my guinea pigs? The sound of Holmes's feet hitting the ground next to me interrupted my train of thought. He rose slowly, looking back at the window. They'll be fine. This way, he instructed as I gave him a questioning look. I had no idea what this was all about, and I couldn't persuade myself that this was a good start for my new life. But I enjoyed it far too much not to follow Sherlock Holmes as he dashed down the street. There we go. That was my reading. Oh, fantastic. You will enjoy it. <laughs> that, that, was, that was brilliant, and it opened so many questions for me, and I'm sure <laughs> for, the, for the audience as well. Uh, we've had a few questions that have come in the Q&A window, but um, for those of you listening in that haven't told us which city and country you're from, please put that into the chat window. And for those of you that haven't put a question in yet, please put it into the Q&A window as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off. Um, there are quite a few questions coming in, but I'll give people a, a chance to, to type. Um, so I'm going to hit you with the first question. When did you first come across Holmes in your, in your world? I think the very first time I, I remember was actually um, a kid's show that was doing a sort of Sherlock Holmes spoof. Um, with, which was a kid's show with lots of colourful bears. And uh, they, they were doing a, a Sherlock Holmes investigation type thing. And one of the kid bears had picked Sherlock Holmes, one of them had picked Dr. Watson. And I remember asking my mum, like, what, what's that about, <laughs> you know? And then I sort of came across the books next, I think, in, in school. Okay. And um, in terms of a particular favourite story or stories from the canon? Obviously, there's 60 to choose from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tricky business. Um, I think the final problem is definitely one of my favourites because it's, it's very different from all the others. Um, and because it's got like it's got so much traveling and and the, the interview with Moriarty is just so tense um, and much more of a um, of, of being actually in touch with uh, with the people committing the crime rather than just having a solution at the end that you usually get. You, you mentioned the M word there. Um, obviously, he, he doesn't appear in many of the, uh, the Conan Doyle stories, but no. you've chosen to bring him into yours. So... Is, is he a key character in your mind in terms of the canon? Um, he's, he's definitely a key character in terms of characterizing Sherlock Holmes as a character. I think that's why he's, he's so uh, widely known outside of the canon because he's, he's the perfect sort of opposite. Um, but, um, well, I, I I do think because there were like because all the other stories are so good and because the um, the connection between Sherlock and John is really what what propels it forward. Um, that's that's how you don't need Moriarty in every story, but I think um, he's a key character in terms of in terms of plot and in terms of how we perceive uh, the criminals in uh, in these stories. So his shadow just sort of being there and you knowing about him makes like a much larger impact than him actually having to appear or anything. Very effortless character. It, it's kind of that nemesis. So if you look at um, the, the, the screen adaptations, you know, uh, the Warner Brothers movies have brought Moriarty in. There's only three movies, but he's in there. Um, BBC yeah. show, of course, Moriarty's in. Um, so... He's he's not that natural nemesis, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Such an interesting character as well. I I think it was sort of it was thinking that crime could be organised in that way was was also probably what was the the innovative thought about him really. Yeah, we had one of our writers. I'm trying trying to remember his name now. He's going to be really annoyed that I can't. Um, but um, the criminal crim, criminal mastermind of Baker Street is the book, and he. he uh, change it around as what if what if Holmes was the criminal mastermind, Mor Moriarty was the the Sherlock Holmes character. He, he turned the whole thing around. I think 
mm. that iconic kind of yin and yang of the, op I think you used the right word there, the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. It works. It, it does work because they are so similar in, in so many ways, you know, so. So uh, a, a good question, good starting question from Nico here. What advice would you give to new young writers that are starting out? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> I think that probably depends what they want to write about um, and, and also what sort of what their writing process is most, what, what writing process is most natural to them. So um, I, I know that with, uh, with the, the students from my creative writing course that I just finished, um, we, we had such different ways of, of coping with writing problems and things like that. But um, uh, I think what, well, I, this, this novel is the first one that I've actually finished. So uh, quite, you know, sort of a, an early piece. And I think the main thing is keep going with it, finish it. And then once you, once you get there, you can still fix everything. <laughs> afterwards so the main thing is that that you get there and then you will want to make it as good as you possibly can because you've, you've got a finished thing there and you know that you've done it um and it's not about the first draft being the best by no means or anything so just sort of getting there that, that that's a really good point i, I think uh wendy freeze is is written a few books for us um uh under atkin uh, as her, her, her nom de plume as well like for, for, for other publishers uh, she taught me that you know just just write every day just write you know set yourself a target write a thousand words whether it's something that you end up publishing or something that you end up blogging just start start in the morning and just write and uh, some of it will be great and some of it will be terrible and some of it 30 years later so you know the bodyguard sat in somebody's in tray for, for nearly 30 years. Yeah, I mean, everyone, you know, Harry Potter was rejected, what, 13 times? And I, I think, uh, I think Beckett was actually rejected um, like 34 times before he got published. So it's, you know, it's, I mean, I, I generally, I am, I feel so lucky that I have been published because I know that it's so hard to, to get your work out there. Um, I was, but, hoping, I was hoping you could go with a bigger number there, Janina, because I was rejected 41 times. <laughs> uh, my first novel was accepted by, by the publisher who, who took the 42nd manuscript. But that was, that was slightly before the days of the internet. So uh, there wasn't the ability to email a manuscript in then. It had to be kind of physical. Yeah. Um, anonymous attendee. We haven't had one of those, actually, for ages. Um, <laughs> their names in. But obviously, it's uh, somebody with a deep, dark secret. <laughs> Be anonymous. Where will your next book take you? Oh, my next book. Um, well, I've, I've sort of got several projects on the go. Um, so uh, I am still working on the uh, the sequel to Spiral Mind at the moment. So um, that is that is Spiral Mind is basically the first of a trilogy, and. Uh, I've got the whole manuscript, the, the first draft of the whole manuscript finished and I'm sort of polishing away at volume two now. Um, so I guess that is probably that counts as my next project. Um, but I'm also sort of attempting another a whole different type of novel that's sort of historical fantasy parody and, um, and a play as well. So. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that the next one is a sequel to Spiral. <laughs> as the publisher, we always love sequels. And you mentioned the word trilogy there as well. That kind of means yeah. three. So that, that's yes. all good stuff. Um, uh, another question from Nico. What positive effects do you think bringing new characters into the canon brings? Um, I think the, uh, the good thing about it is that um, especially with with my new character, I sort of liked having having two perspectives. So my book is is um, from both Scarlett's perspective as well as John. So they sort of take turns narrating the story, and I liked having the new angle where you sort of get shown all these things for the first time and it's all the the excitement of of London and um, and of experiencing uh, the sort of crime hunt for the first time, as well as John's. Uh, already experienced voice and and his sort of 
um, you know, his, his cynical wit in that, as I like putting that in that he knows all the tropes and he knows that they're tropes also. Um, so I, I quite liked that sort of juxtaposition because it's, I think it's, that would probably be much harder to, to try and have John see everything for the first time. Um, so I, I, liked, I liked putting those two voices in. Um, but generally in terms of new characters, I think there were so many interesting characters in the, in the canon that it's not, it's not really a closed concept. And a, a good question from coming in from Lucy. Um, what was what were the challenges and benefits of adapting something as iconic as Holmes? I think um, I actually I, I quite enjoyed having to watch all the adaptations. I've, I think I've watched well religiously watched about thirty five, um, and Sherlock Holmes is the most portrayed human literary character just just <laughs> behind Dracula. Um, of all time so far. And I think there are about 230 um, different adaptations. So it's, it's in that sense, it's a challenge to still do something new, to sort of know what other people did um, and to position yourself in, a, like, in between there, but also to draw from things that you liked and to have people recognize certain aspects from other adaptations, be it the BBC series or be it Rathbone or be it, you know, obviously the, the, the canon, you know. Um, so I think when you've got such a rich heritage and when you've got people who are such, um, you know, ardent fans of something, you need to, you, you feel the need to do it justice. They need to do a lot of research to get, um, you know, to get it. I don't want to say to get it right because that's, that's not really quite how it works, but to, to strike a chord with the, with the spirit at least, you know. But I thought that was quite inspiring for me as well. That helped me get into the writing as well, as much as it as it was extra work. Yeah, one of the one of the first people to sort of tackle it officially was Anthony Horowitz, and I was I was quite lucky to to meet him at the British Library when he did the interview with the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, uh, Roger. Wow. Uh, and he talked about how it was a it was a gargantuan pressure on his shoulders trying to see if he could emulate uh, so house of silk was was he said the the scariest project he'd ever taken on yeah um, you know trying to emulate doyle and doyle's voice i think one of the things that we're excited about with orange pip is is bringing these new voices so uh, you know in the canon it was mostly narrated by john yeah uh, even by saying John, I'm breaking the code because it's what <laughs> the Victorian code is Watson. But you know, Watson narrated most of the stories, and and Holmes narrated a few of them in the canon. But you've, you've got part of it narrated by Scarlett. So I guess when if when we go out there and looking for a narrator for Spiral Mind, should we be looking for a male narrator or a female narrator? Um. Well, I mean, obviously, the best thing would be having having two narrators to do the different voices. Um, but I I don't actually think it matters as long as you as you um, have someone who who feels like they um, they can embody both both voices because I didn't I didn't I really didn't want them to be gendered in any way. Um, so. That I think, you know, I, I mean, the, the narrator is an, is always an important character in the stories because just because of the canon. Um, but it is sort of, you know, it is on the other hand a, a character you can inhabit like any other. So. Yeah, we, we 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 find that there are different types of narration. So we that you know, there's narration which is essentially reading the text, so you don't change voice as you go through the narration. There's quite a lot of that. Um, uh, we had an amazing narrator called Stephen White, who sadly passed now, but he, he had an amazing ability to change voice. So mm -hmm. I think there was, in one of them, 23 different characters with different vo different voices, and he narrated them all with different accents. So uh, <laughs> there's different types of narration uh, there. So uh, coming on to favourite adaptations in terms of... 
Uh, one traditional, one modern. What would, where would you go? Oh, um, I, I, I couldn't possibly decide really. Um, I think I, I'm, I did mention that I was influenced by Rathbone quite a lot. I mean, Rathbone did both eras. Um, interestingly, um, but also I think someone I would like to point out because most people haven't watched him is uh, Ronald Howard, uh, who did a series um, of, of shorter episodes, but like set in in the Victorian period. Um, and he was he uh, intentionally tried to play a more laid back and younger Sherlock Holmes uh, than Rathbones, which I thought was was quite interesting to see that sort of sentiment happening as early as I think the 50s, um, which, which shows like how influential the adaptations were for the time and then people suddenly trying to, um, to do something different. Um, I thought that was, that was very interesting to see. I really, liked, uh, I really liked his portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. I thought that was, that was great. In terms of modern, I mean, modern day, one would, one would probably have to go to the BBC series, except for season four. <laughs> um, because what I liked about that was, was the way they wove the different stories into a new story. Um, and that was a great influence on, on the way I tried to um, write my story also. And uh, uh, I, I did set it in the modern day also. Um, so, but always with sort of Victorian shadows lurking behind the corners um, and they will, they will become bigger as the trilogy progresses. But uh, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed seeing all the different clues from very small stories, name dropping and, and things like that, which if you know the stories, could actually pinpoint you to the solution, but they don't like they don't jar with an audience that doesn't know all the stories. Like I hadn't read all the stories by the time that I watched the BBC series. And then I sort of went back and and read all of them and read the ones again that I'd forgotten about because I'd read them like 10 years earlier. So um, I, I thought that was very stimulating. And um, yeah, so I think I'll have to give them credit for that. I, th I think I've probably mentioned this on, on previous uh, um, events, but quite controversially, I'm gonna go with um, House. Oh yeah, I mean House absolutely absolutely counts I've, I've seen a few episodes of, of that um and I think it's it's interesting to to see that as an adaptation because obviously it's very it's very far removed but it's it's very visible when you when you know what you're looking for so, so it's interesting how um Conan Doyle is often referred to as the, the father of all modern crime fiction so crime fiction is the biggest genre in the world um bigger than anything else. And uh, one of the other adaptations, which uh, probably even more controversial is Jack Reacher. Yeah, I mean, that also makes sense. Um, I, I think it's, that's, that's just the joy of Sherlock Holmes really, because he sort of creeps into, into so many different worlds, doesn't he? Um, yeah, so, so the, the Jack Reacher connection is quite interesting. So. Um, Lee Child has uh, actually participated in one of our anthologies. So Lee was very kind to, to, to do a foreword in the MX book of New Sherlock Holmes stories. And when we talked to him about that, he revealed that he was actually at Granada Studios. He was actually oh, really? in there when um, Brett was doing the Granada series. So the, the, the influence of Conan Doyle over so many adaptations is, is big. Um, Anya has asked a question, which effect does your experience in directing have on your writing process? Yeah, so <laughs> Anya knows, knows something more about me than other people might because she's a good friend. Um, so I uh, actually did um, a lot of uh, filmmaking before I uh, started writing uh, Spiral Mind. I did, I did do writing before then as well, but I, I never like, did a, a project as big as that. Um, and uh, so, and I've done uh, a bit of theatre as well, a bit of stand-up. Um, and uh, yeah, mostly, mostly enjoy directing my own writing um, because I, I feel like I don't have to <laughs> tell the director what to do. Um, but uh, I think what it does, um, especially with the different media, with um, knowing how to tell a story 
through film and through theatre. Um, it sort of it helps you visualise uh, things and it helps you to um, to sort of give you very new, not necessarily literary perspectives, but um, to put in new literary devices um, that that might remind an audience of um, of a screen and to to sort of, to be aware of of um, how to establish scenery with um, uh, with description and um, I think that probably uh, what's most prevalent is that I do tend to describe dialogue uh, quite a lot as well I, try, I tend to drop a, a word here or there because I already sort of hear it and want to convey how I'd imagine an actor saying it because obviously that's what you're missing out on in a novel um, so yeah so uh, a final question for me, uh, while I'm going to ask this question, I'll, everybody else, if you can fire something into the question window, uh, we'll have some uh, a final couple of questions for, for Janina. But for me, uh, when I was writing, I always had a, um, uh, an actor in mind uh, when I was, I, was, I was writing that particular character. With Scarlett, who do you see as, you know, down the line, as the publisher, I'm really hopeful that this will be the case, that it will be a massive Hollywood block blockbuster for the trilogy. Who would you see as Scarlet? Um, I actually picked a relatively non-well-known uh, actress, um, because I do also do that, uh, called Catherine Steadman, who has gone into writing as well now. I don't know if anyone um, picked that up. But um, yeah, she appears in historical dramas quite a bit. Um, I, I think she's in Downton Abbey as well. Um, so yeah, she was sort of the face I had in mind for it. Um, and a sort of witty, free spirit, um, energetic, but sort of a bit feline because I imagine that, um, well, I imagine her as, as quite a feline character as well as Sherlock actually. John, not so much. Um, I think I think John's got very different vibes there, but uh, that sort of I I do also enjoy um, picturing my characters as certain animals because that helps me uh, describe their behaviour as well. In a way, <laughs> don't know if that sounds like like some scientist in a lab, but uh, yeah. Well, you you have to you have to visualise your characters. So so jo John and uh, sorry. Watson and Holmes <laughs> in the traditional sense. Did you have anybody in mind for those two? Uh, they actually kept changing because I tried to, um, my, the reason I wanted to start writing this was because um, I felt like none of, the, none of the adaptations I'd seen had sort of captured all the facets of all of the adaptations and stories that I'd seen. So I tried to um, I try to put a lot of facets from a lot of adaptations and stories together. Um, so some scenes I would uh, I would picture as as Rathbone and Bruce, and some scenes I would picture as Ronald Howard and um, uh, Marion Crawford, and then some scenes I would picture as Nigel Bruce and uh, and Robert Downey Jr. So uh, <laughs> very much very much depends um i think uh yeah i mean obviously obviously when it comes back to martin freeman pop up um but uh, a surprisingly large part also um from the private life of sherlock holmes uh cropped up as well so uh yeah i enjoyed that so maybe when we pitch it to the uh tv company we'll stick with scarlet's recommendation on and then, and then some and probably someone new i mean you know we'll leave it to them we'll leave it to them yeah uh, what are your thoughts on the, the 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 recent adaptation with enola holmes did you enjoy that yeah i i did enjoy that actually um i think i think it very much achieved what it was trying to do it was it was obviously not um you know not your traditional sherlock holmes story but it it wasn't I, you know, I, I, I also don't think that it, it was necessarily uh, about Sherlock Holmes as much as, as it was about um, his sort of 
uh, his family and uh, and their sort of um, involvement in this weird intelligent crime solving that they do. Um, and I, I thought they did that quite well. I liked I liked the characters, um, and I I also quite enjoyed uh, how they how they established the the plot and then uh, went through it. So the so final question of the evening from, from Anonymous um, is, uh, how long does it take you to come up with the crime plots and the, the clues? Is, is, that, is that easy and quick or is it, is it of the dialogue and the other bits and pieces difficult? Um, for me, I, I, I quite like doing the dialogue. That's quite, quite uh, the thing that goes quickly for me. Um, and sometimes I just take some of the dialogue that I sort of improvise and then uh, take clues out of there and spin something from there. I had the like I had two. I, I've got two sort of big overarching um, storylines, uh, mystery lines. Um, one of which I knew the solution to. The other one I knew a part solution to. And then you sort of have to fill in the blanks as you go. On. But I felt for me it was easier to um, start writing and let the characters move and breathe, and then to. Um, sort of follow them around and they will find things that you can then use later on um, and I think uh, I, I've got like several smaller mysteries in um, like in I've, I've divided them up into into parts so um, volume one is in three parts and um, and the parts have sort of smaller mysteries and those were um, some of them came along through um, just through random clues that I picked up on when I read through it again and wanted to write the next passage. Um, and some of them I planned at the start and sort of then had to take up again. But with the big plots, I think um, that was that was quite quite difficult. And that's the thing that I'm still working on that you, you with, with two or three books, it's quite a job to keep all the red threads in mind that you have laid out for yourself to gather back together in the end. Um, and that does require quite a lot of a lot of work, I think, simply because of the, the sheer volume of, of clues and um, and storylines that you need to bring together. But it's definitely it's definitely an enjoyable part of it. And then, you know, once you once you have a piece slide into place at the end and you know all the different scenes where you set that up that is the best thing <laughs> fantastic well it just remains for me to say thank you so much janine it's been a wonderful interview and i'm sure the fans have had a great time asking you questions and uh, for, as a publisher looking forward to book two and book three in the trilogy Yes, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for having me. Um, and I hope I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, thank you so much to Steve and to Nico as well for taking this book on. Um, I was so grateful and uh, curious to see where this journey goes. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Janina. And uh, thank you everybody online. And uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.